Uh, first off, even before this, so your assignment number one. So I have that mostly graded, but I will pass that out on Wednesday. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say about that. And I haven't yet come up with assignment three. Are there any questions about assignment two before we go in? Yeah. How are you submitting the assignment two? Paper. Beginning a, yeah, in class, beginning a class. If for some reason you can't be here, give it to some other student or drop it under my um, door. I guess if it's different, it would need to be differentiable. Um, yeah, you could come up with your own. Um, my thoughts on them were all ones that we had covered at some point or other. So, other questions? Yeah. Question one, if you like coding it up, can you just like print out the output to Jupyter Notebook? That would work. Okay. Yeah, that would certainly make clear what's going on. <coughs> yeah. Other question? All right. Uh, sigmoid num numerical stability. So on Wednesday, I had talked about this. And then all of a sudden, I got a little confused as to how it was we were actually avoiding instability. And I have gotten less confused. So uh, the idea is that the sigmoid function has two alternate representations. And we can use either one of these representations to do our calculation. And it turns out one of them works better if the argument is positive and one works better if the argument is negative. So what I'd like you to consider is, let's say, uh, sig sigma of 800. All right? And let's use the, this one here. We're going to get e to the 800 over e to the 800 plus 1. The question is, what's e to the 800? It's, it's big, all right? I mean, 2 to the 800 is big, and e to the 800 is somewhat bigger. Um, so it's big. In fact, it's so big it can't be represented in whatever Python uses as its floating point, which I guess is a double, um, probably. So um, it can't be represented in a double. So you get a, a, a runtime overflow error. So we don't really like runtime overflows. Um, and so therefore, if we instead use this one, then we're going to get 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 800. And e to the minus 800 may underflow in the sense where you can't represent the point zero, 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 whatever. Um, but it's going to end up as just zero, right? And so therefore, this is going to go to 1 over 1 plus 0, which will go to 1, which is fine, right, for sigmoid. It's like, OK, 800 and above is going to be 1. We can't really differentiate between those. That's fine. Questions on that? And then the same argument holds if e is negative, right? If e is negative. The first formula is going to provide us an overflow in the uh, denominator. And so to avoid that, we'll use the second equation. So that's what we're doing here. Questions on that? Okay. You won't normally have to deal with this because normally you'll use a provided sigmoid function rather than writing your own sigmoid function. But keep this in mind. If in, at, at some point you are writing your own sigmoid function, you will run into a problem unless you have these, these two separate cases. All right, convolutional neural networks. Uh, this is more than an introduction. We were introduced on Wednesday. We're going to first just sort of recap uh, convolutional neural networks, and then we're going to go in some actual architectures. Okay. So let's look at an example here. So here's our notation, right? We're using the superscript bracket L uh, to mean layer L, right? So as we've done before in dealing with other neural nets, we're using that syntax. And F is going to be our filter size, okay? 
So if we have a three by three filter, F will be three. The number of kernels is gonna be n sub c. So we'll get to that in a moment. Um, the output height and output width, because those can be different. And then the padding and the stride. So let's look at an example. Here is layer L minus one, right on the left. And I'll try to, whenever I write L, write it in cursive so we can distinguish it from one. If I fail to do that, let me know. So this is layer L minus one. So what does this tell us? This tells us we've got a tensor coming in whose height is in sub H, L minus one, and whose width is in sub W, L minus one. And we have in sub C of them. So if this were our input layer for the dog breed example, what would these values be? Height would be? What do you guys use? Like dog breed, you, remember you wrote this up, you submitted it to me. What do you always use for a size? There was, that was one of the param one of the values you set was kind of the size to use for the image data loader. And so it's probably 224. So it took all of the incoming images and scaled them to 224. So for dog breed, this was probably 224 by 224. Need the height and width to be the same? Now, is the convolution going to work if you have different height from width? Sure, you're going to just dumb, you'll end up with an output different height than width, right? Because we're still going to just, we're going to take squares from a rectangle instead of taking squares from inside a square. And then what's our depth in the dog breed example? Three, red, green, and blue. All right. And then if we go ahead and run a convolution, we're missing a small bracket there. But, um, right, so we have F by F by in sub C one minus one. So a, a, a common example might be we have a three by three by how big? How deep is this? What's it got to match? Got to match here. So the in sub C is the same as the in sub C here, right? So in this case, it'll be three by three by three. And let me just make clear which threes. Right, this three is the same <coughs> as this three. Now, how many of these do we have? That is, we've got one here, and there might be another one here, and we have another one here, and eventually we get to this one. Which one is this one? Yes, n sub c of l rather than l minus 1 because we're at layer l. Okay. So when we do our convolving, what you can think of these as is looking at different features within our input, right? So we might be looking for, and let's just come up with some, uh, horizontal lines, vertical lines, uh, diagonals up and down, uh, greenish patches, because we might be recognizing dogs it wouldn't be particularly useful for, but if we're looking at foliage, that would be very useful. Um, other sorts of features here, right? And then, what do we get as the output of this? This particular convolution, right? We're basically saying these layers all match up with these layers, and we're doing this pointwise multiplication, and then we sum it all up, right? So again, it's, it's important to keep in mind if we have RGB input, we don't have a single three by three matrix that's operating the same way on R as it is on G as it is on B, unless these happen to be identical. Could we have these identical, each of those three by threes for red, green, and blue? Could be, right? Maybe you're looking for straight lines and you really don't care what the color is. You're just looking for, for horizontal lines and so you would do the same look through each of the color channels. But you might do different things, okay? And this gives us the opportunity to do those different things. So how many multiplications is it gonna take to go for a single pixel in here? How many multiplications is it gonna take us?
for this particular the red channel, how many multiplications are we going to be doing to end up with a single value here? This matrix? This matrix? So I'm looking at a single pixel within here right now. So for a single entry, and I'm calling them pixels, and they're not really images, but they start out as images, and I kind of think of it as image, images. So um, a, a particular value in here is going to be computed separately from all the rest. So let's say this is 3 by 3 by 3, and this is 224 by 224 by 3. And we're looking at the, this value. Say that again? 27, right? We've got 9 for the red, 9 for the green, 9 for the blue, because basically we do 9 multiplications for red, and then we go to the green channel, 9 multiplications, and the blue channel, 9 multiplications. And we're always using different values for each of them, right? Because it's the first layer of the convolution against the first layer here, the second layer of the convolution against the second, the third against the third. So we'd end up with 27 multiplications here. And then if we multiplied it out, we'd, we'd see how many total multiplications. What's this depth going to be here? How many of these outputs are there from convolutions? Right. So we have in sub c at l channels. So the number of convolutions tells us how many channels we have out. But think of it as features is a reasonable name for this. Does every layer just produce one output? Because if you are doing this convolution, uh -huh. Well, we're going to have one tensor output of size. So our output of layer L is a tensor of, and tensors is a generalized matrix, right? What are the coordinates? N sub H at L times N sub W at L by in sub C at L, right? Because basically, we're just taking each of these, of which we have in sub C of L of them, and stacking them. The number of neurons in the The number of convolutions in, neuron in, in, in layer L, OK? So these are the convolutions we're going to be doing. These are the outputs before we stack them, and then we stack them. And what's the nice thing about stacking them like this? Right? We have a stack. I don't know why my stack is going down to the right. But anyway, we've got this stack of them. What's that good as input for? The next layer of convolutions. Right? So now we can take this layer. That's the input. This is not necessarily 3. And we go on. We define some convolutions. The size of this convolution, we get to determine. Right? That's part of the, the architecture. The number of channels we get to determine. Do we get to determine the size of this output, the width and the height here? What does it depend on? So it'll depend on padding. It'll depend on what else? Stride. What else does it depend on? the convolution size, and finally, the input size. So the input size, the convolution size, the padding, and the stride all formulaically tell you how big you're going to end up. So if you have a 3x3 three three convolution, and you want the output to be the same size as the input, the easiest way to do that is what? Zero padding, this is going to get smaller. right? We'll get smaller by one in each direction because of the fact that the first pixel we can, the first convolution we can do is whoops, here, right, against this one. 
we can't use the centered on the top left pixel because we don't have any data on the top and the right. So therefore, this is the first thing we can do. So we're at 1, 1 is where we're starting. And at the bottom right, we're going to be at sort of n minus 1, n minus 1. So we're losing the outside border. So that's why we're going to be one smaller. So if we want it to be exactly the same, what could we do? Add padding of uh, two on each side, but it's just one. So we, we say padding is one because we'll put it the same everywhere. If we have a 7 by 7 convolution and we want to keep the same input and output sizes, Three, right? Because we basically got three on the edge, and then one, and then three on the other edge, and that'll that'll work out right. Okay. Uh, and this is all assuming we have a stride of one, which is sort of the default for convolutions. If we have a larger stride, then we're going to get a smaller result here, unless we had some crazy padding that you know where you're doing convolutions just out in the padding, and that that would be craziness. So, questions here. This is sort of our review of the convolutions. Uh, let's also just remind ourselves about pooling. And there are a couple different kinds of pooling. The, the pooling we talked about was what? Max. Another one is average. It works just like max, except you do an average. <laughs> so if we've got a Let's make it a 4 by 4. And we do 2 by 2 max pooling. What size are we going to end up with? Assuming we have a, sort of a standard, in fact, what would be the standard stride here? Yeah, so the standard stride would be 2. And the standard padding would be 0. So if you want anything other than that, you have to specify it explicitly. And so we would end up with then a 2 by 2. And each of these new values would be the max or respectively the average of the four coming in. So this is often used as a way to just reduce the dimensions, okay? the width and the height. And let's see. So the max pooling might be useful if you want to know, is there a butterfly uh, somewhere here? So let's say we have a butterfly feature in our previous layer, right? We don't, we don't, it just happened to be, to be doing butterflies. So if we have a butterfly anywhere in the top left quadrant, the max pooling will tell us that, right? Because there'll be a high number for that feature. Yeah, the, let me give you an example. So let's say, We've got a bunch of things coming down here, right? So this is incoming. This is layer L minus 1. This is layer L. What are these things that are coming in? <coughs> the features from the previous layer, right? One of them might be, so this one might be a butterfly feature detector, which means it's decided that If it's got a high number in here, that there's a butterfly in that area. And if it's got a low number, there's not a butterfly. So we can then pass that up to a smaller dimension using max pooling. And this would maintain kind of the, where the butterfly is. Now we lose some of the location information, right? Because we have less resolution here. Our resolution in the, after the pooling is only 2 by 2 as opposed to 4 by 4. But we know it's somewhere up in the top left.
So the weights are all changing and this makes the most sense if we look after the fact. And we say, okay, we've got our train network here and we're dealing with gardens where it might be reasonable to have a butterfly detector. And we can go in and we can look at this particular output and say, gee, when we feed in images with butterflies, this thing fires a lot. And it fires in the location that it is. So after the fact, we could kind of determine that this was a butterfly detector and then see what that means. Okay, but it's some detector of something. And the max pooling says, it happened in my area. Well, the convolutions will be happening to the test set. Why will the convolutions be happening to the test set? Let's say we take a single test image. What are we going to do to it? Feed it through the network. So it's getting convolutions, right? So, so it's, it's the same process that's happening to it. We just don't have the backwards pass because we don't have the, the label. Other questions? One question I have. So we decided, we've got all these weights in our network, right? And we decided that we're going to find the gradient. We're trying to do this, this, this minimization problem. And so we say, how does the cost function change according to a particular weight, right? Your weight three in layer two coming in from neuron five, right? And you're another weight, and you're another weight. And I'm gonna individually say, okay, for you, how does, my, how does my loss function change if I twiddle you a little bit, right? Increase you or decrease you. And we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna update your weight so that it does better for the cost function, all right? Now let's say actually you are the input to you. Okay, and I say to you separately, right, I'm ignoring everyone else, if I change your weight, what happens to the cost function? Okay, it'd be, it will make the cost function better if we decrease you a little bit. And for you, it'll be the increase. But did we say, is it better if we decrease you given he's increased, right? We're not taking into account all of the other changes we're gonna be making, because we're gonna change all the weights at once. Will the cost function necessarily go down? No, we could have some, some bad results, right? Because maybe when we change your value, and then you've also changed your weight, we overshoot where we wanted to go. Okay. How do we fix the overshooting? What hyperparameter is there that prevents overshooting is the learning rate. So the learning rate is what says, don't move too much because we're changing everyone all at once and who knows what'll happen, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So true or false on if we are using batch gradient descent, Right, where we take the entire batch of training examples and only update the weight after we figured out the gradient across all of them. After we update the weights, will the cost function be lower? Or if it's true or false, it will be lower, necessarily, because we looked at all the training examples. And it's easy to see why the answer is no. If you, have a, if you use a learning rate of uh, e to the 800, no, or you know, e to the 100, a very large number, you're pretty much guaranteed it'll be wrong, right? So it depends on the learning rate. Now what about with stochastic gradient descent? If you have a mini batch, not only do we have the question about the learning rate, what else do we have as to why our loss function across all our training examples might go up. 
we're using now mini batch. So now we're saying we have how many how many images did we have for dog breed? Okay, a bunch. We had uh, ten thousand five hundred thirty-two. Okay, dogs. So the we calculate the loss function for ten thousand five hundred thirty-two, and then we take a mini batch of one hundred twenty-eight, and we run one backwards propagation step. And now we have our weights are changed, and now we calculate the loss function again across all 10,532. <coughs> Why could the loss function have gone up? Independent of the learning rate problem. Give me an example. Let's say they're dogs, right? There are all these dogs, 10,000 of them, and you chose, the 100 you happen to choose are all uh, Doberman Pinschers, okay? So what are you going to train the network to do? Yeah, I'm, you're going to do better on Doberman Pinschers, by God, and it probably will do better on Doberman Pinschers, but everything else, it's like we don't care about anything else. Anything else can go to hell. Right? So the, the golden retrievers, maybe we're much worse on. So therefore, when we do all of our batch, our loss function may have gotten worse, even though we were better on the particular mini batch we got. The reason mini batch works is because we assume it's a representative sample. And how do we assume it's a representative sample? Is it? We randomize it. Yeah, exactly. And every time we run a batch, Right, a new mini batch, we re randomize. So we're not passing in the same mini batches for every epoch. Sorry, for a particular epoch, we're partitioning our, 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 our images into mini batches. But when we go to the next epoch, we partition differently. All right. Okay, so a little bit of history. So there is this competition. Uh, which was held, I don't know what happened before 2010, but basically we had, oh, 1.2 million images labeled with each of 1,000 categories. Does this sound familiar? Right, this is ImageNet. This is what the um, networks that you used for dog breed and that we used for dog and cat were pre-trained on. Okay. So in 2010, the error was 28.2%. We say one accuracy because there's also a five accuracy. It's like, what were your top five predictions? Is when it, was any one of those right? So back when, that was pretty important because one accuracy was so low. Right? So five accuracy is clearly uh, higher than one accuracy, right? Because if I tell you, you don't, it's like uh, if you're doing horse racing, uh, it's better if you have a bet on someone coming in win, place, or show, right, first, second, or third, then just first. First is necessarily harder than first, second, or third. So 28.2% error, right, a 72% accuracy, less than three quarters. And then it got up a little better, and all of a sudden we got a huge increase in 2012. Right? 2012 is, oh, and prior to this, people weren't using deep learning. Right. They, were, they were using handcrafted features and a whole complicated pipeline and lots of engineering to, to make it work. And AlexNet was really the first that said, let's use these convolutional neural networks and come up with one, and came up with an astounding, uh, much better accuracy. And then the <coughs> next year, with some small modifications and some changes to how the training worked, right? things like learning rate, epochs, uh, initialization that we'll talk about on Wednesday, stuff like that. Then they got even better. And then in 2014, there were two competitors, VVG, VGG and GoogleNet, and they got even better. And then ResNet, which is what we used for the dog and cat, got substantially better. To the extent that they don't have this competition anymore. It's not worth it. 
people, when they come up with new architectures, will still run in this just to make sure they're not you know, worse. Um, but it's gotten, I believe at this point, sort of superhuman in the sense that if you have any individual human that goes through and does this, so there's a grad student that did this, said, let's come up with what is the error rate for humans, and wrote himself a little web program that would feed him images, and he would label them, and then look at, at, at how they compared to how they were actually labeled in the, uh, uh, labeled images. So, Part of what's happened here is the depth of the networks. We're going to see that the depth increased from AlexNet, where it was uh, around, I think the number is seven or nine, to maybe 16 to ResNet. Give me one depth. 34. 34 is the small version of ResNet. Someone else used, you guys used the larger one, didn't you? Yeah, you used 101. Right. And nowadays, there are neural nets that are as deep as 200 or even 1,000 layers. Okay. And the key thing about this was how do we train them? Both how do we train them correctly so that they work, and how do we train them quickly? Okay. AlexNet used GPUs. Two GPUs, very fancy each with three gig of memory. Ooh, it's a lot. We're, we're using, what, on my machine, I think I have 11. Um, K80 has, I don't know how much, somewhere on that order. And you can get now, you know, GPUs with 30 gig or something. Okay, so here's the architecture of AlexNet, the architecture diagram. These architecture diagrams are all gonna look kind of different because they're from the original papers. And of course, the original papers do them differently. So this is ImageNet classification with deep convolutional neural networks. So I don't want you to understand this exactly. We're going to talk about this in more detail. But just see that there's a convolution here. How big is this convolution? 11 by 11. How big is the input um, image? 224. What's the stride? It says it's 4. So if the stride is 4, and it's an 11, then we can calculate what the output size would be. Uh, we had this handy formula we looked at on Wednesday. Um, and let's see if we put it like f n minus f over s floor plus 1. And there's a plus 2p on the numerator as well if we have padding. Um, so we can figure out what these numbers are. But then there's a max pooling here. Here we have a 5 by 5. How, how many how many 11 by 11 convolutions are there at that first layer? 25. How do you get 25? I, I'll throw in an and why. Yes. Two hundred and twenty divided by four. We don't divide by eleven because our eleven is moving across, right? Yeah. Where we don't have a stride of eleven. If we had a stride of eleven, yeah, you might be right. So, in fact, I'll tell you the answer is fifty-five because we can read it right off from here. Um, but that's not my question, is not what are the first two dimensions of the outgoing tensor here. My question is, how many convolutions were there in that layer? There are more than two. I mean, I see two pictures here of two. This is just kind of showing what's going on. There, it, and you're reading 48 here, and what is this telling you? What is this 48? Is that where the 48 is coming from? This is the number of convolutions because the number of convolutions in this layer tells you the third uh, dimension of the outgoing tensor. But it's not actually 48. 
because there are two 48s. It's 96. What happened is they actually took a top and a bottom layer, kind of. So they said, we'll take 48 of them and output them into the first GPU. And up top, we'll put them into a separate GPU. And then they go across, and they do a 5 by 5 convolution just up in the, in, the, in the top GPU, and another 5 by 5 in the bottom GPU. So there's no communication between them at the second layer. From here to here, the lines show that there's actually communication back and forth between the GPUs. Okay. So we're fully connecting the tensor outputs here and the tensor outputs here. Fully connecting them and then separating them again. So we're kind of mixing them so that the top GPU has access to the features that we've got so far from the bottom and vice versa. And then we separate them. And the only reason we separate them is for speed. So we don't have to keep talking back and forth between the GPUs because that's slow. Make sense? So the key of AlexNet, there were several parts to it. One was effectively using GPU, or effectively using two GPUs. Right? A second was the design of this architecture. And I'm sure there was a lot of fiddling to get this right, right? Both in depth and how big to make these and everything else. Oh, and we end with two fully connected layers whose size is pretty big, right? 2048, uh, but this is actually 4096 across the two of them. And they're fully connected, notice again, across GPUs. So fully, fully connected, not two separate fully connected ones. And then we take that out into a 1,000, what, what are these neurons? Relus, sigmoids, Soft. softmax, right? Because there's a we want the probability some of the probabilities to be one. Okay, so this is a softmax layer. All right, let's look at this in a little more detail. So we've got these what we're going to call eight layers, but we're actually sometimes putting more than one thing in a layer. What we're what we're really counting are sort of convolutions and fully connected layers. So our input is 227 by 227 by 3. We do convolution 1, because we've got several layers of convolutions. And here I'm ignoring the fact that we actually have these separate GPUs. And today we don't do use, right? Today, if we were to use AlexNet, we would not separate them. We would just put them together, because we could fit fine in a single GPU. 96 11 by 11 filters with stride 4. 96. Right? Matches with 96. 55 is equal to, let's see if we get this right, F plus 2P. No, that's not it. N plus 2P minus F over S plus 1. Does that sound familiar? So 227 minus 11 is 216, divided by 4 is 54, plus 1 is 55. That's, that's nice. So. so now, this 55 is equal to that 55. That's fine. That is part of the decision of this architecture, right? Because it worked a lot better than 48, and uh, 192 was too big. <laughs> so uh, that's one of the hyperparameters, really, here. There have been some neural nets trained to design neural nets where they have control over, like, how many convolutions, what size convolutions, and so on, how many layers, all that sort of stuff. But as you can imagine, it gets kind of slow, unless you have lots of machines um, to, to try each one. All right, we do 3 by 3 pooling with stride 2. 
What stride would you normally expect with 3x3 three three pulling? 3. That is, they are adjacent to one another without overlapping. Here, when we have a stride of 2, how much overlap is there between two adjacent pooling operations? There's, there's an overlap of 1. Okay? So we can figure out then how big that's going to be. Basically, if we didn't have any overlap, it'd be sort of 55 divided by 3. Given that we have overlap, it's roughly 55 divided by 2, right? Let's look at the numbers. Yes. OK. Plus 1. Uh, floor, not plus one. <coughs> Normalization. This is another very key thing that AlexNet has. Uh, so this is what made this trainable. We were going to talk about normalization in more detail on Wednesday. Okay, but it's a it's it's a way of normalizing the outputs from one layer into the inputs from another layer, so that the weights don't get too out of range. So the idea kind of is if the ranges, if the weights get really big, scale them down. And if the weights get really small, scale them up. But do so in such a way that the next layer doesn't get all confused. Right? Because you can imagine the next layer might have been assuming we had some sort of kind of magnitude of what was coming in. But we're gonna we're gonna maintain that magnitude, but while still normalizing. And it's gonna it helps tremendously. In, in making this work and not having the exploding or vanishing gradient problem. Whereas we're passing the gradient back, the weights are so big or so small that we're just losing it. Right. Then we do another convolution in the max pool and a normalization, throw in three more convolutions, right? And the number of them is all kind of different. And, and notice kind of what's happening here. What is happening to the, the width and height? Shrinking, and what's happening to the third dimension? It tends to be increasing, like 96 to 256 to 384. How did we go from 384 to 256? I mean, with max pooling, but what did we choose to get this 256 value here? The number of filters in the number of pooling filters, right? No, this is the input. I take it back. Ugh. You're right. This is the number at the previous layer. I confused inputs and outputs. Uh, how many max pooling? Uh, well, actually, when you're max pooling, do you have a choice of how many max pool units to use? No, you, wanna, you need to match up with how many inputs you have because of the way the max pooling is working. And then some fully connected layers. And notice we've gotten as far down as 6 by 6. So when we're down at 6 by 6, six, by six we've lost a lot of information about where stuff exactly is in the image. Right? We know it's kind of up in the top left, sort of sixth. Maybe, because even here, because of the fact that we're using like a, an 11 by 11, our receptive field is fairly large. So the number of pixels we're looking at is fairly large. So this top left pixel in here, in the 6 by 6, probably can see more than just 1 sixth by 1 sixth of the original pixels. Probably can't see the bottom right, but we'd have to go and kind of look and, and figure that out. So let's, let's do, and this just shows this in a different form. Uh, and for some reason, I switched the, the uh, vertical axis. So the input's now on the bottom, and we're going up. So, but this just shows a, uh, just a summary of our network. So let's look at how many parameters. That is, let's just look at the number of weights that we've got at each layer. So let's look, for instance, at the... Oh my goodness. OK, so we're going to have to. I normally have cheat notes on my, uh, on, on my printout to make sure I get this right. So let's figure out, though, for the first uh, layer. How many parameters do we have? How many learnable weights do we have? 
121, so I'm going to write out 11 by 11 by 96. So that equals 100 times 100, so about um, 10,000, right? About? Here, I'll make it better. About? OK. Uh, what about, let's say, this layer here? Three by three. Well, is that? Yes, three by three by three to four. So which is 300, 1,000, 3,000? So that's pretty small. What about here? Yes, that's a good point, and I wish I had put my cheat sheet down there so we would have fixed this. So let's think about this, okay? We got our 11 by, we got our convolution, it's 11 by 11, but it's not 11 by 11. It's 11 by 11 by the depth of the previous layer, which is 3. So it's 11 by 11 by 3, uh, here, we'll just cross that out. 11 by 11 by 3, and this is the convolution size, right, by 96. So my guess is going to be about a factor of 3 bigger. And if we come down here, it's not 3 by 3 by 384, it's 3 by 3 by 256 by 384, which let's say is around... 700K? Is that, am I in an order of magnitude there? All right, now let's get down to this one here. This is fully connected, right? So this is not convolution. We don't have to think convolution. We just go back to fully connected. How many inputs are there? Six by six by 256. We're just taking them all and just hooking up every one of them as inputs. And how many outputs are we going to? 4096. Okay, so 4096 is what? 2 to the 12th times 2 to the 8th, so we're at 2 to the 20th times 36 is around 5, so 2 to the 25th. 2 to the 20th, so 2 to the 10th is 1,000. 2 to the 20th is a million, so we've got about how much? 32 million. And by the way, the working powers of 2, uh, if you haven't already, it's really useful to know. Like 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 10th is a special magic number, right? Because 2 to the 10th is about 10 cubed. Um, and then know some other ones, like 2 to the 32 is 4, yeah, 4 billion, 4 gig. Right. And you can remember that in a variety of ways. Like, that's as big as you can make a file on such and such a file system because they use a 32-bit number to unsign to keep track of it or so on. But those are all useful. Anyway, so we got 32 million there. We've got here 4096 by 4096 equals, so that's 2 to the 14th times 2 to the 14th, right? So 2 to the 28th. So... This is approximately uh, even bigger, right? So uh, we're multiplying this by 8, so around 256 meg. Is that right? And then here, 4096 by 1,000. So this is about 2 to the 24th. <coughs> so our total is something like 380 million. Okay, this is roughly, I'm, I'll guarantee it within a, a power of two. Okay. Where's the vast majority of these parameters? The last three layers, right? We've got here 300 of them, basically. 
So we'll see that in later networks, we're not going to have these fully connected layers. We will just dump them. Okay. We still got to have, of course, connections to our 1,000 outputs. Questions on this, on the sizes? So there's a lot of weights to learn. Okay, Alex note, or Alex net notes. So they were the first common use of ReLU. All right. Before that, everyone was using um, 10H or Sigmoid. And that had problems with learning because it was easy for the slopes to get close to zero right, as you got to the edges. And so therefore, if you had extreme values, it took forever to get away from them. Heavy use of data augmentation. Give me an example of data augmentation. Transformations, yeah. So uh, rotations, zooming, cropping, flipping, all those sorts of things. Uh, they also did, uh, I think, color, some color changes as well. You could make things blurry. Why, why might that be useful? Yeah, let's say their input is people sitting on their cameras that are, that are you know, not in focus. So. They use dropout. We will talk at much length about dropout. I was going to say Wednesday, but at this point it may push to next Monday. Where did they use dropout? I believe it was in the fully connected layers. Yeah. Um, uh, used... I said the normalization was batch normalization. I had forgotten. They used different normalization layers and didn't use batch normalization. So this is, uh, today, <coughs> batch norm is used. Okay. And it was eight layers. Yeah. So this is this idea that we have not yet learned uh, but that I just mentioned a little bit earlier, of we've got a, a, a bunch of large weights from one layer to the next layer. How can we reduce the magnitudes of those? Put them in a reasonable range is really a better description. Right? Get them so that they're like around one would be good for a mean uh, or zero, but, and, and with a variance of you know, one or something, as opposed to having really small numbers or really big numbers. That's the idea of batch normalization while not still screwing everything else up. This is a key thing to keep in mind. And it was eight layers, and as we're going to see, eight layers soon was uh, considered very small. But as you can see, with all of these parameters, um, these, these fully connected layers were really a problem. Any questions on that? Now we'll switch to uh, another architecture, which basically was two years later. So VGG 16, what do you think the 16 means? 16 layers. There's also a VGG 19, which has three more layers. So this is a conceptual picture of what this looks like. So we have our input is 224, 224 by 3, 224 by 224 by 64. So that tells us we have 64 convolutions. Do we know how big they are? No, but we know that probably the padding is the convolution size divided by two. Then we have, and this is very common, smaller height and width, larger number of convolutions. Smaller height and width, larger number of convolutions. Same thing again. So in some sense, we're keeping similar volumes, kind of, which, yeah. And then, we have max pooling here. We're again using ReLU and convolutions. We basically convert ourselves down to a 7 by 7 by 512, and then a single fully connected layer, rather than in the previous case we had two fully connected layers. Okay. So here's sort of our comparison. And what was done here is Several convolutions in a row and then a pooling. Several convolutions in a pooling. Several convolutions in a pooling. What does a pooling do? Shrinks down. 
give an appropriate choice of stride, right? But that's really what we're doing here is we're shrinking it down. So it was reducing by a factor of two in all cases. 224, 112, 56, 28, yeah. So, so therefore, it was two by two pooling, probably with, with uh, two stride, standard stride. And going back a second, I misread this one, I'm sorry. Two layers of 4096 fully connected. So it's two fully connected layers at the end. So given that, and given the others were 4096 as well, our cost here is around how much in terms of weights? Yeah, it was a, was it a hundred? It was 300 million. Yeah, 300 million. So we're not going to get much better in terms of reducing uh, the number of weights here. Uh, now, so if we say 138 million parameters here, then what are we doing wrong? Well, one possibility is <coughs> The input to the last fully connected layer is 6 by 6 by 256, right? So that's around 6 to the 5th, 2 to the 8th, so that's around 2 to the 13th. So that's like 1,000, 8,000. And here, we're 512, 3 by 3, so that's 9. So that's only 4,500. So we have half at that uh, layer here. Right, which was, I believe, our largest. Was this our largest layer? Yeah. So anyway. So what are some of the things that we are designing when we're coming up with an architecture? What do we have control over? What hyperparameters? Oh, give me one. The number of layers. Give me another. So 4096 by 4096, yeah, because we decided that's 2 to the 28th. Oh, yeah, that's 16 minutes. So maybe we, maybe we calculated it wrong before. OK, that's possible. Um, OK, so we've got number of layers. That's one thing we can control. Go ahead. Size of the convolution, size of the kernel, yes. Tell me where we control the number of neurons in the layer. <coughs> Not directly. If we come back to here, where are we specifying the number of neurons in this chart here? Directly. Indirectly, well, Here, for example, I, I guess, okay, you could call this, uh, you could call this the 64, each separate neurons. Um, yeah, so you do have control over how many convolutions you have at each layer. So when you're dealing with convolutions, both how big is the convolution plus the piddly pooling and stride and how many such convolutions do you have? What else? The size of our in, how do we control the size of our input? Uh, well, we want them all to be the same. So, like if their images, for example, <coughs> have them just compressed to be certain dimensions. Yeah, so yeah, we will take our given images and force them into the image size that we want. Yeah, that works. Uh, Dropout, is that what you said? Yeah, dropout, which is a, we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. Uh, pooling, like what is the max or average, or also stride and. Yeah, where to put max pooling, right? How you want the width and height to change, let's just say shrink, because that's what always happens, but how you want that to change, yeah, principle. Um, what's the activation function? Activation function, but what are we using here? 
yeah, ReLU for everything except the very last layer, which is softmax. So al although technically you do have control of that, practically here they're not, they're not. AlexNet definitely used that choice. And, it, and people just followed along from that. Okay. So these are the, some of the things that you have control over. Does that make sense? Okay. Google Net. Um, so going deeper with convolutions. And it's because it's a deeper network. Okay. So this is the diagram, which we're not going to look at exactly quite like that. So it's based on inception modules. So they have these modules. And a module looks like you have a layer. I, I don't know whether I should have a 1 by 1 convolution or a 3 by 3 or 5 by 5 here. I know. Do them all. Okay. So we do 1 by 1 convolutions. We do 3 by 3 convolutions. We do 5 by 5 convolutions. We might want pooling, too. Who knows? Let's do some max pooling. And then combine them all together, concatenate them all together. Okay. The concatenation is going to work only if our width and height are the same for each of these. So we're going to have to arrange our 1 by 1, our 3 by 3, our 5 by 5s, and our max pooling so that we have the same width and height. And then we'll just sum together all of the channels here, right? all of the features. So if we've got 10 features here and 3, 10, 10, 10, and 10, we have a total of 40 coming out. So our outgoing tensor would have a depth of 40. Exactly, that would not be to shrink because we're not getting shrinking. We would use pad and stride, exactly. Yeah. So that so that we end up with the same. Um, so leave it to the learning to figure out what we want here and what's best. Okay? Right? If it turns out we don't need a five by five convolution, no one will ever go update any of those. You know, weights. Those weights will just be, yeah, just leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. No one will ever use it. This is a meme that was referenced in the paper. Uh, I don't know if you remember the, the movie Inception. Yeah, so that's where they got the, the name. So. Um, so let's look at the size. So we've got, let's say, an incoming 28 by 28 by 256. And let's see what happens. If we're going to do one by one convolutions, we're going to do 128 of those one by, one by one convolutions. Let me just check something. Okay, I know how to go know how, know how to go forward and back road back by one, which is important. We'll have let's say 192 three by threes and 96 five by fives, and then 96 max pools. So let's look at the output because that's important. So 28 by 28 by 128. The 3 by 3 will arrange, if we do padding of 1, we can also get a 28 by 28, but this will be by 192. Our 5 by 5, if we want 28 by 28, we're going to use padding of 2, so we'll get 28 by 28 by 96. And finally, in our 3 by 3 max pooling, if we want 28 by 28, what will we do? What sort of stride will we use? Yeah, we'll want to have one stride. Zero stride, I would not recommend. So uh, one stride, and we'll have to also add padding. Okay? And presumably the padding will be such that it won't interfere with the max pool. Right? So it'll be negative. Well, if we've got rel use coming in, the, ma the minimum is zero anyway. So. Does that make sense? And so what comes out? 28 by 28 by, and just kind of pile them all on top of each other. 28 by 28 by 128 plus 182 plus 96 plus 256, so that's around 500, 12 probably, somewhere around that. Oh. I'm just looking, what's my 525,000? I'm, I'm going to just cross out that 512K because right now I don't remember what that, uh, I don't think that's 28 by 28 by that number. So that's 1,000, 
Oh. No, yeah, I think that is, because that's 512 by 1,000, yeah, which is around 512K, 525K. Yeah, so that's fine. Yeah. Uh, that 96 on the 3 by 3 max is going to be too On the 3 by 3, max pooling, max pooling should be 256. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, very good. Okay. Yeah, and did we have a control over 256 there? No, unless we're going to somehow max pool across multiple layers. Uh, no, we have is, the number here is the number. Here. Questions on, on this? Okay, so. Actually, let's look just a little bit. Uh, yeah, the size, the size just gets to be big, and so the question is how can we, how can we reduce it? So we'll take a 28 by 28 by 256. We'll have our same 128 one by one convolutions. And then we will do one by one convolutions. So let's think about that. A one by one convolution. How many things are you multiplying together for a one by one convolution? Assuming this is the input. And it's not one. It's 256. Because we are taking every single one of these convolutions is going to look at, all, at a single element at, at the entire depth here and do a weighted sum of that. So we're doing a 256 weighted sum, which sounds a lot like a, a neuron, right? Imagine a neuron that had 256 inputs, that had 206 weights, and it multiplied them together. And that's kind of what this is doing. It's sort of like a network within a network. So, to speak. so we are taking and we're saying we're going to do 64 of those. So we used to have a 256 input, 256 channels depth, and now we're going to reduce it to 64 channel depth using a nonlinear mapping from here, right? So this gives the neural net the opportunity to learn these 64 features based on linear combinations followed by a ReLU of our 256. So there's less information than here, the potential for less information. Than here. And then we can go ahead and do our 3 by 3 convolutions. And the advantage here is, so we have 28 by 28 by 64 coming in. Instead of previously, it would 28 by 28 by 256. And so therefore, our, our weights needed for our 3 by 3 convolutions will be reduced by a factor of 4, right? From 56 to 64. We do, can do the same thing for our 1 by 1. We're not, sh why, are, why don't we just share these convolutions? Right? Do one of them and feed the output into both of these. What's that? Yeah, what if they need to be different? What if the 3 by 3 is just interested in different stuff from here than the 5 by 5 is? OK, and then for the max pooling, um, we go ahead and do the max pooling, and then do, we do a subsequent 1 by 1 convolution to reduce the number of features. So we can end up here with 64 of the uh, max pooling when we're done with max pooling and done with our one-by-one one convolution. <laughs> so we end up now with a total of 375 instead of the 530 or something. So we're a little more than a half. But that saves saves number of weights there, right? I don't, I don't think it quite captures the weight saving because the calculation you're doing is only on the last layer uh, and its weights, whereas we're also saving in the previous That's true. So we're saving it not only at the top level, but all, all the way down here as well. Yeah. So, so this will make it faster to train because we've got fewer weights. All right. So let's look at Google Net 
and we look at this, um, this part of the network. Okay. Really, this is an inception module. Okay. This green part is part of the previous inception module. So my rectangle's not quite accurate there. Right. The reason I wanted to show it like that is because we kind of want to see what's coming in from the previous layer. So that's why I have this here. But think of the concatenation as occurring kind of in the, pre in the previous layer. Okay. So you can see we've got a bunch of inception modules. How many inception modules are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine inception modules. Okay, where our output is at the top and our input is down here. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to there. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a weirdness, but we'll get there. Okay, so we'll get there. So we just build this up for modules, and we're building up from stack inception modules. Okay, stack inception modules. So we don't have any choices. We don't, the only really thing we had a choice of was what did we do at the beginning, because we did a little bit of work at the beginning, and how many inception modules do we have? Ignoring the little stuff hanging off the edge. Questions on that? Does that make sense? Okay. And so this is kind of nice because we're saying let the training of the neural net learn in some sense what the right architecture is. You know? All right. Let's look at the first layers. So the first layers, we have 64 7 by 7 convolutions. This is just showing a stride of two. A max pool, we'll ignore this a moment, and a couple convolutions, a 1 by 1 and a 3 by 3. So, and then at the output, this is interesting. So at the output, we do an average pool. Okay, it's like what? A max pool, except it's an average. Um, and that is going to give us, right, it's going to shrink the size if we're doing a normal stride of seven. So it'll shrink the size, and then we just take every one of those outputs and feed it fully connected to our final output layer, which is of what size? Given that this is ImageNet. 1,000, which is 1,000 categories. There's a larger image net with, I think, 20,000 categories. So that, that's available. So we're saving a bunch of weights here just by not bothering with that fully connected layer. Okay. The sticking out parts. That's the technical term for that, I think. Um, this is only used during training, right? Our final output when we are doing inference, which is what's called just taking uh, uh, images in and trying to label them. So during inference, we ignore those sticking out parts. But during training, our loss function, so let's look at here. Here what we've got is we do some average pooling and some fully connected layers and we do a soft max. So the idea is take these features that we've got so far, right? They're not all the way up at the top of the food chain, but the way we've got so far, and let's throw a little bit of work in, especially some fully connected layers, right? So they can do some learning and get an output. So this is kind of like, how good is this from here down? And then we say one more, okay, two thirds of the way, how good is it? And then we've got our final one. And when we're training, our loss function includes the loss from all three. The final one, we wait a lot more, but the other two, we wait some. Why? Back, that, that, that is the, the sort of insight you want. Backup propagating through a lot of layers can be a problem, okay? Because you've got these gradients, you know, we have 
exploding and vanishing weights. And so what this gives us is a shortcut to get to these weights and update them. It's not updating them ideally, but it's updating them somewhat, right? Because we've got these two fully connected layers that allows it to learn some. And so what can you do in these two fully connected layers in terms of learning? What sort of features would you like? And our hope is there'll be the same sort of features that'll be useful up above. Concept make sense? All right, uh, 22 layers, 10 million parameters. A hugely smaller number of parameters than uh, VGG. So we will continue on with um, ResNet on Wednesday, and then we'll also probably start talking about other aspects like initialization and things like batch norm and stuff like that. All right? Remember to bring your assignment to on Wednesday. And I will be in my office until around four, well, four or five. So if you want to come by, feel free.